how does that work as far as like how they view a clinical model like yourself? Would that yeah. only enhance your development even more? Hey everyone, welcome to our latest TDR exclusive, psychedelic exclusive, I should say. So getting back from Benzenga and some interesting news last week pertaining to the space and how we see this clinical model rolling out, including one company that tends to be the leader in the space right now who also released their latest earnings last week. We welcome Peyton Nyquist back to the podcast, Numinous, which trades on the TSX under the ticker symbol NUMI. Good to see you. How are things? Things are well. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Um, so let's dive right into it. You announced last week, uh, second quarter 2023 financial results. Uh, as we look more closely at the latest results, you'll find that the growth numbers looked strong year over year. Revenues mm -hmm. did fall sequentially and total client appointments declined slightly as well. But overall, what do you think is the big main takeaway uh, that you want to communicate to investors based on your latest results? Yeah, so the the past quarter is is seasonally the the quietest quarter uh, for us, and so you know while you saw maybe a, a very small dip in regards to revenue, the 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 big reason for that is is just because of seasonality. It's the holidays. It's it's always a quiet time, especially for you know some of the. When you in the psychedelic space, when you think about like ketamine therapy, that's quite a time commitment. You see a dip in those kinds of treatments just because of how much it actually takes to to be involved with those treatments. Um, but I think the 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 one thing to highlight in regards to this last quarter as well, as you said, strong year over year growth, but also new client appointments went up as well, which yeah. is really key for us because of how much client retention we do have. Um, you know, I and as we look towards the future, and and I know we talked about burn rate the last one time we talked, and that that's you know a, a, an active conversation, especially with a lot of yep. other clinic companies closing their doors. Um, you know, we've spent the last couple quarters, and you know, it's funny if if you look at our previous quarters quarterly, we've grown you know pretty much every quarter over the last number of years, and over this last quarter, we've spent a lot of time really integrating, understanding the business. So that we can strategically and intelligently bring the burn rate down without cutting our nose off to spite our face. And you know, we also recently announced last week the the launching of our numinous licensing program, which is really, you know, the one thing we haven't wanted to stifle is growth of the company while yeah. effectively managing the burn rate. And so now with the launching of the licensing program, which which I know we're going to talk about. Um, we have the ability to really drastically bring down the burn rate while continuing to grow the business, the platform, and increase profitability. That that's that's a big announcement last week. With uh, as you said, from what I've learned, just as far as building your footprint across the U.S., not only from an operation ownership standpoint, but from a branding standpoint as well, and providing the education amongst a lot of people. And from what I'm hearing and seeing. <clears throat> this is the number one reason why a lot of these clinics are not profitable. It's the it's the therapy side that a lot of these ketamine clinics are not providing. So it's a one and done type thing, which I was unaware of that I've learned. So I guess these are some of the things, I guess, based on the proper education, the partnership with MAPS, um, and probably the number one reason, as you said in the past, that I didn't realize Novamind uh, has been uh, basically providing uh, ketamine for patients for up to 13 years, which I was unaware of. But when we look at this announcement from last week, how do you bridge that gap? You know, it's yeah. a great lucrative opportunity, but however, at the same time too, are we still looking at 12 months out before the FDA approves his MDMA? But do you really need to focus on that announcement to make this all come to fruition to obviously preserve uh, cash burn as well? Yeah. Really good question. And, and I think, you know, we're at a very exciting time on the kind of clinical provider side of the business um, or side of the industry, I should say. And, yeah. you know, if you look at, as you said, you know, there's been a lot of clinics that have opened up. A lot of them are struggling financially. And if you look at our clinics on a clinic by clinic basis, especially in the U.S., we've shown that, you know, we know how to get sites that are operating profitably sustainably and continuing to grow. And there's now a, a huge amount of clinics that have tried and have not done well, but want to continue to offer care. And this licensing program allows us to 
go into either new locations or find practitioners that want to be, be able to offer and get ready for one, offer ketamine therapy, but two, get ready for when MDMA is available while still being able to offer their traditional practice and, and get prepared for that. And so this licensing platform that we've built you know, is really consolidating all of the expertise we have around clinic management and being able to scale that without, you know, the costs associated with either acquisitions yeah. or, you know, building and creating brick and mortar infrastructure ourselves. So as we look to bring on now these licensees, it's all net positive for us. You know, the, the, the overhead that we attribute with the licensing platform is typically marketing costs, or financial management, yeah. both of those structures we've already built. So it's, it's you know, wow. the, on, the, on the economies of scale side of things, as we look to add on more licensees, that profit, again, that the, the push towards that profitability, you know, continues to increase with this model. Um, and, and to that point, if, if you think about, you know, one of the things thinking about MDMA and you ask what's different about what Numinous is doing comparatively to some of the other like ketamine focused clinics is you, you have to be able to offer a model that's rooted in mental health care. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, I would say probably our biggest differentiator. And if you think about to, to have people understand an MDMA therapist is only going to be able to do probably one MDMA session a week for, for somebody. At, at probably the most. So you've got to be able to also provide them a platform that allows them to just also do traditional therapy. Because if you don't, that person is going to go and do that traditional therapy somewhere else. Wow. And you're always going to be in competition with this other place that they're practicing at, right? Right. So what we really focus on is, yes, you have the ability to do ketamine therapy here and in the future, MDMA and psilocybin, but you can also bring the rest of your clinical practice here as well and have it all under one roof. And that also helps feed the continued, you know, interest. A lot of our ketamine clients, as an example, are clients who have been working with us just for mental health care. Right. And eventually they go, you know, I want to try the ketamine thing. I want to try TMS. But if you're just solely focused on offering ketamine therapy, as you said, it's this very high turnover, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, transactional kind of yes. relationship which actually doesn't coincide well with psychedelic therapy in general. It's People not who are going through this intervention, they need ongoing care and support. So they're, they're, they're necessary parts of being able to offer psychedelic therapy anyways. And that's been the feedback that I've heard like 50 years ago, we screwed this up and they, they're, they're, there's a lot of people that are very cautious to make sure that we don't screw this up again. So when I look at, just help me understand when it comes to the overall education aspect, because a lot of these ther therapists need education, help educate our viewers as to why you're able to provide that with the proper education versus other players in the space. It, you know, again, I, I, I think it comes down to a couple of things, the partnerships that we've got, um, but also with our clinical trial business, you know, we, we, we get a look you know, we're running LSD trials, we've ran the MDMA trials, we've run psilocybin trials, we're running all of these trials within our own clinical infrastructure. And so when you think about a practitioner, like a new practitioner, that's good, like wanting to work with an organization and be, you know, really at the leading edge of psychedelic therapy, yeah, they want to work with a space that knows what they're doing. And, yes. you know, that that's where our clinical trial business, one, it's, it's very profitable for us. And two, you know, it gives practitioners the opportunity to work with a, an infrastructure that is running these treatments within their own clinical infrastructure right now. And so we we really look to leverage that with the training side of the business, which just to, to round that out, you know, to, maybe we'll take MAPS as an example, right? MAPS is going to be the distributor of MDMA, the drug, correct? they're only going to offer that drug to people who have the MDMA therapist training that MAPS provides, right? So we've really looked to scale that MDMA training and be able to offer it to people so that there's a, a you know, a, a gateway for people to be able to offer that therapy. It's, it's, not going, it, it's not going to be just broad access for everybody once it's approved. You have right. to have the training. How far ahead do you think you are when it comes to the uh, education 
uh, standpoint versus, uh, again, other companies or other, uh, um, I guess, institutions in the space? I, I don't see... I don't see any clinic operator offering really robust training, especially in regards to like things like MDMA. Um, you know, they're, they're certainly doing parts of it. And then you have, you know, different training organizations like CIIS that are doing great work, but they're not attached to any clinical infrastructure. Right. Yeah. So what we're giving people the ability to do is start your practice today and get your professional development while you're continuing to grow your practice. So you can come work, you know, at a numinous location today, offer traditional therapy while continuing to educate yourself around ketamine, getting prepared for MDMA, getting prepared for psilocybin, all within the same infrastructure, right? And not only that, but you're you're able to engage with other practitioners who are on that same journey as well. Yeah, we had Cody Chandra on a couple of weeks ago and he touched and alluded to how there was a couple of insurance codes that were approved and rather ironic, it's in and around the same time that the phase three readouts are going to be coming related to maps. Yep. So we've discussed $25,000 out of pocket related to psilocybin and MDMA in Australia. How does the insurance landscape look in the U.S.? It's a it's a great question. And, you know, as we look at this licensing platform we've created, that's a, a huge component of this also is you know, we now get over 80% of our ketamine gets covered under insurance, not just bravado, but actually off-label ketamine assisted therapy, which is quite unique. And we're now able to take those relationships and infrastructure and be able to apply it to not only other um, licensees, but other psychedelics as we continue to grow as well. And if you think about an insurance provider, yes, we're a clinical operation that's already ran these different thing, different, you know, therapies through our contract research organization. So, you know, as really insurance is probably going to be the biggest bottleneck for access in the yep. space. 100%. Yes, there's going to be some people that are going to pay out of pocket, but those that can get insurance reimbursement are, are going to be the place that obviously people are going to want to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we get more insurance reimbursement than pretty much anybody else in the ketamine space. And now being able to scale that out you know, sets us up very, very well for when MDMA is approved and, and, you know, ultimately psilocybin and other psychedelic compounds as well. You ever thought and looked at like what your true market potential is when you look at your, you know, license uh, agreement or a license announcement from last week, combined with the clinics that you own. And let's say the FDA does approve like an MDMA, and then you have diversification within certain clinics do you have like an idea, your model alone, uh, as far as like revenue opportunities uh, within the next year or two on an annual basis? You know, I'll, may, I'll maybe frame it in a, a little bit of a different way. So since 2017, which is when us and, and a few others, you know, the kind of first corporate interests in the psychedelic space uh, got in, um, you've seen $2.9 billion come into psychedelic uh, interested or related investments, right? Okay. Less than 5% of that $2.9 billion has gone into uh, infrastructure and service delivery. The only way to unlock the value of that money that went into drug development is through service delivery. Right. You're not going to have insurance companies like uh, me at home like, uh, it's just, I, I think insurance companies would be too skeptical of something like that at the early stages. And, and, but that's, but so when we talk about the size and scale now, there's all these different drug development um, projects that are underway. They, they all need clinical infrastructure. And, and really the time is sort of right now, starting with MDMA, with maps, but then going into psilocybin with compass yeah. and all of like all of the, the the only mode to accessibility again is through this clinical infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. Point nine billion dollars, less than five percent, providing the thing, which is crazy when you think about which it. Which is crazy. Yeah. So you, yeah. 
Um, here's a scenario I wanted to throw your way. How does big pharma look at the clinical model? Like when we look at potential, and I don't want to talk about buyouts because we're just getting started, but in the event that we walk down this road and, you know, let's face it, big pharma is going to be interested in this space, especially if you have positive, positive readouts pertaining to maps. But yeah. how does that benefit your relationship? Let's say, for example, maps does a phase three readout. Um, uh, big pharma is interested. They come in, they buy maps. What then, how does that work as far as like how they view a clinical model like yourself? Would that yeah. only enhance your development even more? So the, the, I think the a very important distinction around this is that drug developers like Big Pharma, you, you can't be the provider of the drug and the owner of the clinic as well. There's a conflict right. of interest there, so you can't do that. But if you think about like big healthcare organizations like Cleveland Clinic, or, or, you know, billion, billion, like multi, multi-billion dollar organizations. The, the thing we've continued to hear from them is they're not interested in trying to figure this out. They want, you know, the smaller organizations, to, they're very, very busy. They want the smaller organizations to go figure out what yeah. this service delivery model is going to look like. And then they'll either partner or acquire. And that presents just a huge opportunity because they're going to rely on organizations like ours to provide access to this care. Right? Yeah. And there's a huge amount of people that have expressed interest in psychedelic therapy. And a lot of these other, you know, different um, healthcare services, you know, the larger healthcare service providers, they're just going to look to to outsource that until it makes enough sense for them to just bring it in house. Yeah. So are you garnering interest from like, if you had conversations, like not to sit here and say what could be down the road, but just to say, Hey, we watch you. We notice what you're doing. We're impressed with what you're doing with companies like say, for example, a Cleveland clinic. Absolutely. Wow. Impressive. Um, It's fascinating how fast this industry is, but it's needed, which is really, really good. And mm -hmm. I guess it comes back to like, you know, I guess a lasting comment for your investors. So you don't want to cut off, obviously, your marketing and strategy off the nose as far as your burn rate. So moving forward, you know, people's questions were, and we had this conversation three months ago, that if we continue at this pace of two to $3 million in a per month basis, they're going to be out of money by the end of the year. You're thinking next quarter, you start to see that scale back. But as far as growth and money and monetization through announcements like last week, what can you communicate to investors to say, okay, I'm still very content and happy with the direction of this is going? Yeah. So, so two big things. One is absolutely managing the burn rate. There's no question about it. Yeah. But now with the announcing of this licensing platform, the, the new website is launched, which is really foundational to, to, to having one source for all of those licensees to be able to connect with. We've rebranded all the clinics to be numinous branded so that anything going forward will also be numinous branded. So there's a path for not only growth, but increase, you know, the time to profitability with this licensing platform. Yeah. Now we go manage the burn rate considerably without, as I said, cutting our nose off to spite our face, face and showing a very, very clear path and helping, frankly, maps with which within the next 12 months, if MDMA is launched, if you look at their feasibility study that they launched with the FDA, based off of those numbers, they're going to need something in the neighborhood of probably 40 to 50,000 trained and offering therapists. They have less than 2,000 right now. And you will be at the forefront of that education. Not only the education, but then being able to educate and then giving a turnkey solution to those practitioners we've, we've educated saying, and here's a clinic. So with this new licensing agreement, you're collecting data off of these clinics too with the agreement, yes? Yes. Wow. It's impressive. Yeah, it's just, I, I've looked at other players that have aggressive plans as far as expanding their clinics and uh, it's, it's. Um, you know, you shake your head. Some people are like offering clinics in exchange for shares of different companies. And it's just like, it's not really the proper way of doing business. But at the end of the day, uh, it's all about the partnerships that you have. And uh, let's face it, profitability, which uh, appears to be the case with what uh, you have envisioned. But listen, 
great update. I hope uh, obviously our viewers get an idea or at least a better understanding, not only about the latest, you know, quarterly earnings. I don't really get caught up in the quarterly earnings in this industry right now. I just talk about, as you've said all along, the institutions and research analysts that I spoke to last week, very positive about the space, your company in particular as well. But uh, it's all about pathway to revenue, which uh, we've been trying to emphasize and uh, a strategy in place to, you know, avoid, you know, companies like Field Trip. They sounded sexy, but uh, there was really no pathway to revenue, which is not the case here, right? Exactly, exactly. Listen, keep in touch and uh, keep up the great work. Great announcement last week. And uh, we'll speak to you soon, okay? Thanks. Appreciate it. Hey, take care. Take care, buddy. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. And if you want to learn more about the emerging industries that we cover, then leave a comment below and let us know who you want us to interview, the questions you want asked, and the information that you want to learn. We want to hear from you. As usual, click on that bell for all notifications to get the latest information. Share this video with your network and don't forget to subscribe to our channel because we would not be here without you. Thanks for watching everyone.